Thank you, John. Um, I've asked you this before, but can you remind me again, when did OCAP form as an organization? 1990. 1990. OK, so three years after I was born. Um, <laughs> really, um, I want to speak a little bit about OCAP's work before I go on to talk about the work that I'm a part of with a few people who uh, showed up here today. Um, I've never done any work with OCAP directly, but um, it's played a really important role in shaping me as a political organizer. Uh, it's helped me understand what kind of political work I want to do in this city. And I know a lot of people who uh, would agree with me uh, when I say that it's hard to imagine what Toronto would be like without organizations like OCAP. I think one thing that I really appreciate about OCAP is its community orientation. It's trying to build political power right here, right? By being involved in the lives and struggles of ordinary people like us. And TRT, it's, which is the organization that I'm a part of, uh, it's a relatively recent organization. And it has a much more modest history of organizing in the city, but it's aspiring to do something similar, but in a slightly different way. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. I've been asked to talk about uh, Islamophobia in the city and how we can fight it. Um, I thought a lot about what I can say, um, the smart, intelligent things I can say to impress you. And frankly, uh, the more I, I thought about Islamophobia in the city and what needs to be said, I, I wondered if I'm the right person to be uh, giving this kind of a talk. I don't consider myself a leader or a spokesperson in my religious community. It's a community that I think is very internally divided. And in that sense, it's like every other community. And it's hard to understand how to speak on its behalf. The Muslim community in Toronto has rich people in it, and it's got poor people in it. Uh, it's got people with a range of skin colors. Uh, they come from different parts of the world. Um, and they, they faced unique struggles in their lives. I do consider myself a Muslim, but I want to emphasize that the community that I identify with and that I organize with is the community of the working class Muslims and non-Muslims in the city. And what do I mean by that? And why do I hold that position? Without going into too much detail, I want to share a few things about myself and the community of Thorncliffe Park, uh, where I do a political organizing work through TRT. I was actually born in a small village in Pakistan. Um, I came to Toronto with my family when I was 10 years old. And my dad, he was living and working here um, he was, uh, before he sponsored us. He was working here as a plumber. He, for a living, he went around people's homes cleaning their toilets. And uh, he had a very exploitative boss who took advantage of his situation, right? What was his situation? He was single-handedly trying to support financially uh, a family of eight people. And we were living in a one-bedroom apartment uh, near Dufferin Mall. And uh, I remember a few of my siblings having to sleep on the kitchen floor. My parents, um, they did their best to support us, um, my, me and my siblings, as we were growing up here, uh, but with limited knowledge of English. Um, and just really uh, inability to fit into society here uh, for a range of reasons. Um, the conditions in which uh, I grew up, um, they were economically and socially hostile to my development as an immigrant a Muslim working class woman. And I think it's for those reasons that it took me a long time to feel like Toronto is my home to feel a sense of belonging here, to feel like I have a stake in the politics of this city, to feel I have a stake in the, in the, in the kind of uh, things that go on here. And without erasing important differences, what I want to suggest is that my own personal story is also the story of a lot of working class Muslims here. Uh, let me tell you, for example, about the lives of people in Thorncliffe. How many of you know where Thorncliffe Park is? Yeah? So a lot of the people who live in Thorncliffe Park, they're Muslim. Um, and they're living with neighbors who are Filipino, West Indian, and white. Many of them wouldn't consider themselves poor, but really, what is poverty? I mean, they struggle to find jobs in their fields, even though they've got PhDs from their home countries. 
To make ends meet, they're working multiple jobs uh, that are often under the table. Those who are on welfare, uh, they're ashamed to tell their neighbors. They have to hide it like it's some dirty secret that they're keeping. They're exploited by their landlords. They're talked down to by their politicians who are condescending and patronizing. They face racism everywhere they go. And even in safe spaces, even in safe sacred spaces like their mosques, they have to be careful about how they express themselves. They have to be careful to not discuss their conditions and talk, talk about the government in too angry a way. Because they know they're being watched. And as for their kids, these kids, they're living in a community where there's really not enough room for them. There's not enough room to even play. And they're going to schools uh, where they're not even sometimes, they don't even have access to school textbooks. And the best funded and the most well-resourced programs in their schools, they're reserved for rich kids who come from outside of the community. So it was with the hope of understanding uh, the working class Muslim condition in Toronto, uh, learning from it, that a few of us uh, started TRT, started doing work in, in, in Thorncliffe Park. We wanted to make people in Thorncliffe conscious of, of themselves, of their struggles. We wanted to make the community conscious of itself as a community in a different way than they were used to seeing. Because we knew that without this consciousness, it's hard to know how to effectively protest the conditions that are exploiting them and that are oppressing them. And so, um, for the past many years, actually, not that many years, uh, four or five, uh, we've been organizing. We've been organizing with residents. We've been holding a number of events. Uh, we've been asking uh, what kind of citizens are we, are we in Canada? Are we considered uh, citizens um, like the rest of uh, the people here, right? Or are we second class citizens? Uh, we talked about capitalism, which is something that I know you guys do a lot here too. We talked about policies that the government is pa pa passing that are not in our favor. We reminded ourselves constantly that we are an indigenous land. And we talked about our religion, right? We talked about how we can use our religion, learn from our religion to help us fight our battles in this, in this country and to fight with each other in solidarity with other working class people. And so alongside these events, uh, what we've done also is organize Serve the People programs because we know that it's hard for people to fight unless their immediate needs are being addressed. And we wanted to involve them in addressing those needs. We didn't want to do it for them, we did it together. One of those Serve the People programs that we organized in Thorncliffe was uh, a tutoring program. Uh, because we recognized that school conditions weren't good, uh, students needed, the kids needed extra support, their parents had a desire to learn, right? So we uh, designed a tutoring program that was also a political education program where they not only learned math and other subjects, but they also learned to examine their own conditions, their own realities. And that was one program, but it provided a platform, right? It provided a platform for us to organize. Things started changing though, right? Harper, uh, the policies that he passed, um, they evoked a lot of fear amongst people in, in, in Thorncliffe. Um, and in December 2015, uh, some of you may know, there, was a ter there were terrorist attacks in Paris and that caused um, a lot of Islamophobic attacks to occur here. Do you guys remember that time in Toronto? Yeah? Uh, do you remember that a lot of Muslim women were being attacked, right? They were being attacked in, on subways, they were being attacked in their own communities. Uh, they didn't feel comfortable stepping outside of their homes. And they were having to talk in hushed whispers to their neighbors about what exactly was going on, right? And things got a lot worse uh, when uh, one woman in Flemington, uh, which is a neighboring community to Thorncliffe Park, she got attacked. And what happened is she had actually, she had gone to the local school, elementary school, to pick up her kids. And you guys remember this incident? Yeah? Um, and so there were two racist uh, men who approached her. Uh, they punched her in the stomach. 
they called her a terrorist they stole her cell phone and she was quite traumatized by the experience she had to be taken to the hospital and and as the word spread in the community and evoked a greater fear and we asked ourselves in TRT what is our responsibility in this moment we are one of the social justice organizations in this community what do we do how do we respond because something needed to be done and remember remember we are a small organization very small organization much smaller than OCAP we've been around for like I said only about three years but the work has been going on for longer and we didn't have political strength we didn't have capacity we didn't have a lot of resources but we made a decision we made a decision to not be afraid we summoned the courage where we didn't have strength we had courage to declare that we are not going to be afraid we decided that we weren't going to be victims of a yet another round of Islamophobia and so we got in touch with the family of the woman who got attacked and we involved the students and the parents in the tutoring program in organizing a rally and it was a great action it inspired a lot of people we took over Don Mills uh, we were used to walking on the sidewalks suddenly we were out on the roads and we were pushing cops out of the way and saying no these streets belong to us and that was a deeply empowering moment for a lot of us but I want to also talk about what it is that we decided not to do in that moment right we didn't go to the media and we didn't try to convince journalists that we are innocent as Muslims that we didn't do anything we're not responsible for the attacks that happened in Paris we didn't try to show look at our wounds look at the wounds that Islamophobia is causing us we didn't try to evoke pity and we didn't give free hugs or flowers to non-Muslims so that they can recognize that we are humans too and we didn't just pray inside our homes and our mosques and ask God to come to our rescue and we definitely we definitely didn't waste our time going to politicians and telling them to protect us from these attacks instead we decided to continue do, doing what we had been doing for quite some time in Thorncliff building real community power and we chose the fight once again in that moment to be a fight that takes a place away from the political spotlight most importantly we didn't just react we weren't just loud and angry and assertive we did that but we didn't just do that we affirmed ourselves we reminded ourselves of the labor that we perform in this city in this country the labor that is so dis indispensable so valuable for keeping the society going and we turned to the indigenous community and asked them whether we have a home here we didn't go to the government and ask that question to them and you know the attacks did subside uh, there were fewer and fewer attacks on Muslim women um, but we weren't fooled by that either right we knew that it was going to come again it was going to happen again and Trump's election and what that has ripped up it just kind of confirmed uh, what it is that we the way that we were reading that moment and because we didn't we'd get fooled we actually continued building right so that the next time something happens we respond with more rigor more strength more courage and what that has looked like for us is a lot of self-defense workshops programs and dozens of women we've brought to the space um, in Thorncliffe the community center where we do our programs and we train them uh, and we've had a lot of support from allies around the city to pull this off but it wasn't like individual self-defense it's not like you know let's build some muscle let's learn some boxing moves and next time a racist attacks us we'll be able to hit back we'll be able to punch back right because that individual self-defense it's limiting in terms of how it can help in protecting us what we were pushing for was a community self-defense and we didn't at that time really understand what that meant 
But over the course of planning these workshops and struggling together with other uh, Muslim women, non-Muslim women, Filipino women, uh, we realized uh, what that vision, and, and we still haven't fleshed it out, but we are trying to articulate that vision of community self-defense together. And at the moment, uh, the self-defense, it, it looks like this. <laughs> it looks like Beyonce's formation, but uh, no. Uh, it, hopefully it's something more radical than that. Uh, it's a left hook training camp, that's what we're calling it. Uh, we've invited women from around the city, uh, working class women, to participate in this uh, with us. And uh, we've explored relationships with uh, progressive boxing gyms around the city and uh, received a lot of support, as I said, in, 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 um, in, in teaching ourselves uh, self-defense. You know, as I was preparing for this talk, I, I asked myself what I should focus on. And to be honest, life can be so difficult sometimes that it's, it's really hard to keep up with the news, right? It's hard to keep up with the latest policy changes. Uh, to keep up with the latest politician rhetoric. And I've been out of the loop from that kind of world uh, for a few months now. But one thing that has inspired me in my own personal struggles is this kind of work, right? And the, the insights that have come about, I want to share them a little bit and talk about Islamophobia and the fight against Islamophobia at a more general level. Um, to inspire me uh, and to help articulate some of the points that I wanted to make, I last night I called a number of women from Thorncliffe, a woman who I respect, uh, who um, allow me to and others to do the work that we do in, in, in this community, and I asked them, what should I say to you guys at this talk? And Lots of interesting things came up, lots of debates took place with these women. Uh, this was all last night, midnight. Um, they, were, they were helping me out as they were taking care of their kids and tending to their husbands. But uh, I want to share some of those insights from those discussions. And they unfortunately couldn't be here today because uh, some of them are fixing up their resumes right now uh, to apply for jobs uh, that they don't think they're going to get. Uh, some of them are taking care of their kids right now, going to adult school to help secure a more uh, secure job. Um, and one of them, one of the women, she, she asked a question that I thought was really interesting and which has been on my mind um, uh, as of late. What exactly is Islamophobia? Right? We both agreed that there's nothing mystical about Islamophobia. Right? It's actually more familiar to us than it is something that is new and alien. Yes, 9-11 changed things for Muslims here. It triggered an outpouring of hatred that made the conditions for Muslims like us unbearable in a different way. The hostility and violence that we now experience in this society as Muslims uh, from our landlords, our employers, the media, the politicians, it's taken on a religious dimension. Let's look at the word Islamophobia, right? What, Islamophobia, it suggests that what? There's a fear of Islam, there's a fear of Muslims, but is it really fear or is it hate, right? Yeah, I would say it's hate, right? Because it's hate that leads racists to approach Muslim women and rip off their hijabs, right? To assault these women in public spaces, uh, to call all Muslim men uh, terrorists. It is that hateful sentiment that led to the recent massacre in the Quebec mosque. And I think when we understand Islamophobia as being motivated and driven by hate, then we are able to bring it in a more general, larger structure of racism, which many of us experience. And that's a structure that marginalizes non-Muslims too. And of course, racism doesn't affect us all in the same way. Not all types of racism are the same. And you know, we can spot it when it's as explicit, as obvious, as a massacre of Muslim people who are praying in a mosque. But what about the invisible racism? What about economic racism, right? Racism that has a class character, racism that I talked about already when I talked about my own experiences growing up in Canada and the lives of people in Thorncliffe. That is economic racism. I actually want to show a video um, where uh, 
tenants in Thorncliffe, right? Thorncliffe is a, is a community where people don't own their homes. You've got high-rise buildings and low-rise buildings, and uh, it's the landlords who control the community, right? They control the homes of, these, of, of the tenants. And the conditions in these homes, in, in these apartments, they're terrible. So every now and then, the tenants have had to protest these conditions. Uh, this is a, a video of a rally that took place uh, several years ago. And you'll get to hear directly from the, the tenants uh, the kinds of struggles that they face. Basic housing rights, that's what tenants in an East End community say they are being denied. And today, they took their demands for better living conditions to the streets. Tammy Sutherland now with the heated resident rally on Thurnsworth Park Drive. How can people can live? How can children can live in that kind of apartment? When we're telling them, oh, we don't have a budget. So where do our rent is going? Who's taking our rent? Who's community? Residents chant and march to fight for what they call basic housing rights as they rallied outside a trio of East End apartments. Tenants of 71, 75, and 79 Thorncliffe Park Drive claim building management is neglecting their concerns about an infestation of roaches, a lack of security, and poor general maintenance. Elevators here, worst in the whole city, I must say that. Several times, small children has been stuck in the elevators. Another complaint residents have is about extra fees for air conditioning. A window unit like that one costs residents about $150 extra per season, and that's on top of a host of other complaints, especially ones that have to do with repairs, like this one here in the bathroom. I mean, the water is leaking from upstairs, even from this area too, and that sometimes the flood in this area, in my wife's home. <laughs> We reached out to Q Residential, the property manager, but they did not provide comment. The local councillor says there has been improvement over the last few years, but more work needs to be done by both the landlord and the tenants. I'm also seeing signs of what happens when a lot of people live in close quarters and, uh, and uh, someone doesn't keep up with all of their uh, routine uh, cleaning uh, uh, responsibilities. Well, one unit has bugs, everybody's got bugs. I okay. A lot of time. Yeah. So that's that was John um, John Parker. He is um, he was a representative of this community. He wasn't invited to the rally. He showed up anyways. He wasn't invited because he's done nothing for the people there, other than mock them, disrespect them, telling them they don't know their own interests, right? And so he shows up. And it took a lot of courage for a lot of the tenants to actually bring the media into their own homes, right? It's, it's like, you know, they're putting uh, something that they consider shameful on display for the rest of society to see because they're feeling that desperate about need for change. And what does John Parker say? What was his analysis of their conditions? It's their fault, right? They're not keeping up with their routine cleaning responsibilities, right? Now, that's a case of bad representation, yes, but it's also racist, because who are these tenants about whom he's making this kind of a remark, right? These are racialized immigrants, and he's telling them they don't know how to keep themselves clean. They're savages, right, in other words, barbaric, and if they only cleaned after themselves, they wouldn't have these kinds of conditions to worry about. Now, a child in the tutoring program, she asked, she saw this video, and she was outraged. And she said uh, to us, uh, she said, what do leaking roofs have to say, do with cleaning responsibilities, right? Like, a child can see that, but there are politicians who refuse to see that. And this is why when we, uh, when we had the woman in Flemington be attacked, we didn't turn to politicians, right? Because this is what happens. This is how they represent us. And so the economic racism, the invisible racism, that is something that also needs to be challenged, right? Not just the racism that we see when a hijab gets ripped off, which needs to be fought against, right? But it's the more systemic forces of racism that enable these individuals, that encourage these individuals to be racists in the first place that, that we have to tackle.
And I want to talk a little bit more about self-defense, right? I said that we are trying to build this vision of community self-defense. Now, what is it that we are defending ourselves against? Who are we defending? What does it mean to protect our community? What's the threat, right? You can see that what the threat is from watching this video. You can see that the threat is economic exploitation, political oppression, right? And it's jo people like John Parker, right, who as individual political representatives, they manifest that. They show us what political oppression and economic exploitation looks like. But they too are individuals, and the problem is much more, it's larger, it's systemic, it's institutional, and it is at that level that we want to fight and defend ourselves. And I, we know that in that fight, these fake representatives, right, they're not on our side. We can't have illusions about that. And recently, when uh, the massacre in Quebec happened, uh, we had other politicians come out, right? This is a face that should be familiar to you. Uh, she's actually the MPP of that area, of that riding, and where Thorncliffe and Fleming Denard. And uh, she came out and she uh, claimed that she was a friend, she was, um, she was going to look out for us, she put out a message of love like Trudeau did and reminded us that we are all in this together, right? And she was joined by local service providers, she was joined by a new counselor who was a cop, who was a former cop, right? And um, not many people were convinced by that, right? They didn't buy this, this language of like Canadian unity, national unity, harmony, openness, freedom of religion. They just didn't buy that rhetoric. But there's something going on, right? Because as I mentioned, the working class conditions uh, that they experience, right? And, and the way that, they've, that this mainstream society, that the state has reacted to their resistance against those conditions, it's it's had a certain effect. And the discourse of multiculturalism, it's taught them, unfortunately, to tolerate racism. To get, it's made them get used to injustices, to accept it. A massacre happens, hijabs are ripped off, we're called terrorists, that's just one more problem, right? In a line of like series of problems that, I have, that they're having to deal with. And some of us have internalized the fact that there is something inferior about us, that Canada is not our home. And this we believe, some of us, right, even though we know we contribute so much to this society. We believe, we are told to believe, that Canada is doing us a favor by allowing us to live here. And unfortunately, this kind of acceptance, this kind of internalization of infer inferiority, it doesn't allow for us to protest in a way that we need to protest. It doesn't allow us to be as vocal as we need to be, as organized as we need to be. And so we have Muslim leaders who come out and say that actually politicians are good, right? These are people who are sellouts in our community. They say that Trudeau will do something different from Harper. He's different from, uh, he's different from Trump. They tell us to have faith in Canadian values. They tell us that, okay, maybe it's rhetoric now, but it will turn into concrete action if we just apply enough pressure. If we just get them to back up that rhetoric with concrete action. But the woman I spoke to last night, they said something different. They said they either have low expectations or no expectations from Canadian democracy. Do they like Trudeau more than Harper? Yes. Do they have faith in him as a leader? No. There are few illusions that there's, this is a political game in which Trudeau is making his moves. The vast majority of the people that we organize with, they don't believe for a second that Trudeau and politicians like him are our public servants. To some extent, they are servants, right? But they're serving a racist and sexist system of capitalism. They're serving the elites in our society. And they're able, to, in doing so, they're able to hold on to and expand the reach of their political power. It's in their own individual interest to do what they do. And this lack of faith in Canadian democracy, right, it can lead to something more revolutionary or it can lead to a deep fatigue. And there is deep fatigue amongst the working class Muslims, some of them that we know. The women, for example, uh, they are told uh, especially not to cause any trouble, right? They're told by their husbands, uh, 
just just don't protest just just like deal with it not talk back and i think in the left uh, as as social justice organizations uh one of the things we need to do one of the things we need to do better is to also not put out our rhetoric right even if it's a different rhetoric from what the politicians are putting out right we need to inspire in a different way we need to make people have faith in their capacity to bring about change and that's a really hard thing to do it's a hard thing to do especially when these people are having to do they're having to face so many difficulties and struggles in their own lives some of the women last night right they said like there are enough domestic pressures we have to deal with there are enough concerns around paying rent feeding children right uh the financial crunch crunch that they're experiencing especially in this moment of capitalism with neoliberalism taking away a lot of the benefits that we previously had that we'd worked so hard to win right it's making us even more incapacitated and that's why serve the people programs we feel in TRT are important so that we develop the autonomy and the capacity to serve ourselves and in serving ourselves and each other do something politically different politically radical because we don't want to be dogs right we don't want to be dogs who bark at politicians to change bring about change and then when a bone is thrown at us we wag our tails in response <laughs> and i think um the real struggle right now is to build right it's to keep building not give up even when it's really difficult and it's to build from the ground up it's to have conversations with each other because there is a courage there is an inner strength there is a knowledge that we have that was that's produced through struggle and i know a lot of these women who spoke to me they're not able to come to a lot of meetings but they're yearning to organize fight to teach themselves and become part of something bigger than themselves and their families and in the training camp with the young women that we have who regularly attend these classes that's what we're trying to do to push our limits physically intellectually and to learn how to be effective community organizers i want to say something about uh, allies and solidarity right cuz you know there's a lot of discussion about what it means to be an ally to the muslim community right now and i'm going to put out a message that i think is 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 different from what a lot of um other muslims um are, are saying right now the po- and the point of this talk was really to show that for working class muslims our lives our realities they're closer to your lives and your realities than they are to the lives and realities of middle class and upper class muslims so i would rather in a protest against islamophobia have you guys be on the front lines with us than the phonies in our community the so called representatives but it's vicious right capitalism right now as john talked about it's so vicious it's turning us against each other it's making us fight with each other for the few resources we're told there are limited resources and that we can have more of those if we fight amongst each other we are encouraged to hate each other to attack each other to inflict harm on each other and we are being convinced in a very effective way that our friends are our enemies and our enemies are our friends and i think we can resist those lies we can push back we can discover the truth for ourselves through a collective struggle and for the muslim community right now right we are not self righteous we are victims as in we are oppressed by Islamophobia and those of us who are working class we are oppressed by system at the system of capitalism but we got a lot of shit to work on sorry for the kids in the room we've got a lot of things that we need to internally deal with there's anti-black racism that's within for example the south asian and arab muslim community a number of us and one woman admitted this last night and i really appreciated how honest she was she said she's from karachi which is a city in pakistan and there when the going got really tough when uh, the government took away a lot of benefits 
and a lot of and there was a lot of internal displacement in the country because of the war on terror right these are communities some parts of the of uh, of uh, sorry pa pakistan that were being dislocated in the search for terrorists that were hiding in their midst and uh, some of these communities they fled and some of them went to places like karachi where this woman is from and there was a lot of racism right directed at these refugees these internal refugees and this woman said you know she lost her job and she blamed these refugees for that so she compared that to the way that a lot of the white working class is reacting in the united states in canada in parts of europe and and she checked herself right she said this is a problem that we are having to battle through as well but we need to battle through it because divided right we will fall and so confronting that self righteousness being honest with ourselves within our communities that's an equally important part of the struggle right now i want to end on a note um it's actually um a story i want to share when we were organizing that rally against islamophobia a few of us took on the work of going around the community uh, and letting everybody know about it one contact told me to go to this woman who lived in this building and drop off a bunch of flyers and i was told that she'll circulate it to her contacts she'll give it to all the women who are taking part in all these uh, uh religious spaces within the buildings that aren't like public but they they exist and 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 she was going to kind of take on that part of the work so i went to her home and she gave me water and we spoke about how crazy things were becoming with the attacks on muslim women at that time and we talked about the need to do something to set stand up for ourselves and each other and i had a lot of other people to meet that day um so um i left i had to leave and it was raining outside and it was getting darker so she rushed to find an umbrella for me but i told her i'll be fine without it and she held my gaze and and told me you will be right you have to be there are bigger storms coming our way how are we going to face those if you can't even handle this and i never met that woman again but her words have stayed with me and they inspire me to focus on developing the kind of strength and courage that i feel is needed to deal with the struggles that are becoming more and dif more difficult for a lot of us thank you